Hi, this is Raymond Solder, Dear and Glorious Physician by Taylor Caldwell. Beautiful book, The Story of Dr. Luke, Chapter 50. Hillel wished to provide Lucanus with an escort to Nazareth and Galilee, but Lucanus refused with gratitude. He needed only a sturdy, powerful horse, capable of climbing on short legs. He'd spend many nights on the road in taverns. Hillel was horrified. Even knowing Lucanus as he did, it seemed incredible of him that a Roman citizen of a noble family, a physician of considerable wealth, a friend of Caesar's, should travel like a common man. I'm not trying to be humble, said Lucanus, smiling. I wish only to move fast without encumbrances and to see the country. The horse Hillel produced was Arabian of a calm disposition and accustomed to long journeys and dust and mountains. Lucanus fastened his physician's pouch to the saddle, a blanket, and his painting materials. Hillel insisted on providing a basket of fine foods and wines. Lucanus would wrap his head in cloth against the blasting sun and wear a heavy mantle to cover his legs. With misgivings, Hillel bade him farewell, shaking his head. Lucanus cantered away, wavering, waving his hand to his friend. It was early morning. He left Jerusalem. The air was already hot. The fresh horse trotted briskly. They crossed the river sea drawn over a stone bridge. The sky possessed a deep golden color, and this was reflected in streaks and shadows on the quiet, narrow waters with its ripples of brighter gold. The banks were guarded by black-pointed cypresses. Hillel had advised going by way of Bethany and Jericho so that Lucanus would approach the River Jordan following it to Galilee, which Lucanus would approach, would, which Lucanus would visit first. Lucanus soon found himself in a wilderness, desolate, reddish brown treeless, the earth tangled with high thistles, all surrounded by low flat hills the color of brass shimmering with heat. The rough and narrow road was empty, for it was one little taken, others preferring the longer way on the Via Mare near the sea. Sometimes looking as past the lonely Roman fortress, from the tops of which soldiers peered at him curiously. Once he was halted and challenged by an officious officer who could, couldn't understand how a humbly clad man could be in possession of such a fine horse and on such a road. When Lucanus revealed his identity, the official was more puzzled than ever, but respectful. He invited Lucanus to take wine with him. And as Lucanus was now thirsty, he accepted and entered the cool depths of the fortress, sat on a stone bench to drink wine with a young officer. Upon an inquisitive question, Lucanus replied that he was going to visit Tiberius. The officer noted his splendid rings and said, though no Jew would ever attempt to rob you, not even the barbarian Samaritans, there will be mean, poor caravans on the road 
I won't hesitate to cut your throat for those rings. So Lucanus put them in his pouch. When he was on his way again, he did encounter one or two small caravans of camels and asses and men with dark, fierce faces who stared at his horse. But Lucanus stared back at them. He was of high stature and there was a sword at his belt and his blue eyes were cold and unafraid. He arrived at Bethany dancing in wavering heat waves. The tight little streets were stepped and floating in yellow dust and the people moved about noisily chattering and arguing their stern faces dark with the sun their heads protected by headcloths of black white or brown with dusty robes of the same color the tiny shops boiled with people all of whom appeared irritated and Dogs barked and children played on the steps of the climbing streets. And women with jars on their heads stopped to gossip. A heavy smell of roasting meat, acrid wine, herbs and garlic, and offal hung over the little town. And Lucanus was happy to be out of it within a short time. Then... He was in the wilderness again. The mountains changed, became dull terracotta in color, with outcroppings of clustered villages of a whitish gray upon them. The plains of Mount Lucanus were forsaken with an infinitely solitary and lonely air, scorched and empty. An occasional stick-like dusty palm battled for its wretched life on the brown and crumbling soil, which was scattered with black boulders, scrub and half-dead bushes, matted with the pervading thistles and rearing masses of catechondly increased the melon of cacti, sorry, Scrub and half-dead bushes matted with the pervading thistles and rearing masses of cacti only increased the melancholy of the wild scene. And the sun, like a brazen orb, hurled down its cataracts of unbearable light. At noon, Lucanus suddenly came upon an intensely blue pool of water in the wasteland, fed by an underground spring. To his delight, green-yellow young willows nodded about it and swept their fragile golden branches in the hot air. He tied up his horse after it had drunk its thirsty full of the cool water, and he gave it a bag of, a bag of oats. Then he sat down in the shade of the willows and opened his basket of food. He ate a portion of delicious roast fowl, stuffed with breaded herbs and onions, some oaten cakes, which he covered with honey, and two rich pastries. He drank Hillel's excellent wine, which he'd taken care first to place in the cool water. It was like sitting in the center of a mirage with a savage and barren land all about him and the stony hills fuming with heat and dust in the near distance. He saw no living creature anywhere. A huge silence lay on the earth and the hills. He found himself drowsing, shook his head and mounted his horse again. He took care to keep the road outside of Jericho, but he could see the town itself, all crowding two-story brown houses, pierced with clumps of cypresses, sweltering in the heat, and even at this distance, clamorous wood voices. 
Now he encountered herds of sheep browsing on the tawny grass, and shepherds with somber faces, or numerous goats guarded by sweating and noisy children. He urged on his horse towards the River Jordan, for night came swiftly in this land, and Elel had told him of an inn near the river. Almost imperceptibly, the land began to grow more fertile. An occasional mount bore terraces upon it, enclosing little patches of green grass or palm or olive trees, and even some fruit. Vineyards threw out their fragrance on the dry, hot air. Lucanus climbed a barren mountain, stones falling about him loudly in the silence. He reached the top, and there below him lay the narrow and winding Jordan, impossibly green, bordered with willows and tall, refreshing trees. Smelling water, the horse bounded down the mountain and increased his speed. Upon reaching the high banks of the river, Lucanus dismounted, and man and horse slipped and clambered down the warm, wet earth to the water. The horse drank deeply. Lucanus bathed his head, face, and hands. A sweetness of fertility lay on the Emerald River, which wound sharply into the distance. Little farms stood near it, the white houses clear in the sun or sheltered by trees and cypresses. From this spot, even the pervading mountains had a less stricken and terrible aspect. A child with a flock of geese approached Lucanus, staring at him inquisitively with great black eyes. Lucanus greeted the little girl kindly. She hesitated, then replied in Aramaic with the accent of the Samaritans. He beckoned to her, wishing to give her one of the sweetmeats in his basket, but she didn't approach nearer. She thought of the Judean and the Samaritans were always in a quarrel with their fellow Jews, thinking them too cultured, too superior, and playing tricks upon them during the holidays, such as lighting fires on the mountains to confuse the priests. Suddenly she laughed shrilly stuck her tongue out at him with impudence and ran off for the geese who hissed and squawked behind her. Lucanus, mounting again, followed the incredibly winding river and refreshed his senses with the small farms, the sound of cattle and sheep, the twittering of many bright birds in the dark green trees, the golden fields of barley and oats and wheat in the falling light, and the pleasant white square farmhouses with their happy gardens. The sides of the mountains were cultivated here. They looked as though colorful Persian rugs, gigantic and many-hued, had been tossed on them. Now the light fell more rapidly, the river changed to running gold between its banks. The sky flushed to scarlet and jade over the mountains. The air became cooler. Then Lucanus found the inn near the river with a cobbled courtyard made of gleaming black stone the inn was small but clean, and the landlord greeted Lucanus with pleasure, noting his horse. Not even Lucanus' unaccented Aramaic annoyed him or chilled his Samaritan heart. He didn't often shelter travelers with such horses, 
and Lakina's manner at least assured the landlord that here was no poverty-stricken man. He was so pleased at having this visitor that he decided not to charge him more than three times the regular fee for food and shelter. He led Lucanus to a small, neat room facing the river and assured him that he would find the bed comfortable and untroubled by fleas or lice. Lucanus looked at the bare white wood of the floor and nodded. He sat down wearily on the bed and yawned. The inn was filled with the hoarse voices of men and their loud laughter. Horses stamped in the stable. Feet sounded on the stones of the courtyard. A servant girl or two laughed merrily. Through the rough lattices that covered the one little window, a scent of fertile earth and grapes and manure invaded the room. Accompanied by the good smell of roasting goat meat and baking bread and thick spicy soup. A maidservant without knocking on the door brought Lucanus a pitcher of hot water, a bowl and a rough brown linen towel. He gave her a coin and she was so surprised and delighted that she favored him with an arch giggle and examined him more closely. His appearance pleased her, though his fair skin was hot and red and burned from the sun. She curtsied and left him, went down to the kitchen to talk of the strange gentleman who had given her such a rich coin. Lucanus opened the lattices and looked at the blood-red sky over the mountains. He heard the murmurous voice of the river talking to itself among its trees and willows. He carefully washed his face, wincing and anointed his burning flesh. He then went down a steep little flight of stone stairs to the common dining room, where at least ten travelers were already seated. A huge stone fireplace crackled with lighted wood, and on a spit meat slowly turned, and a girl basted it with its fat droppings. The floor of the room was flagged, the walls white plastered. The other travelers fell silent at the sight of Lucanus, their swarthy faces becoming watchful as they tried to place him as a Judean, a Galilean, a Samaritan. They had put aside their head cloths and their hair had been rudely combed. Their eyes glistened in the mingled firelight and lamplight. He greeted them carefully in the Aramaic. At first they didn't answer him. They shrugged and exchanged glances. Then they replied wearily. The Galileans were almost as fair as he and many of the Judeans. But he didn't have a Jewish appearance for all his perfect speech. Now the glistening eyes became suspicious. He smiled at them, but they didn't smile in return. He thought anxiously of his pouch upstairs with his rings. He'd locked his door, but thieves were never detained by locks. He remembered old Kusa and his skill and smiled again. The men didn't speak for some time. They felt an alien present. The men glanced at Lucanus' poor clothing and were puzzled. He had an air of assurance and calm in spite of his clothes. They'd already heard of his fine horse. He was mysterious with his princely manner, and they didn't like mysteries. 
a silence brooded over the one vociferous table. The soup was thick and good, laden with spices and herbs, and filled with bits of boiled flour and meat. The travelers ate in morose quiet, peeping occasionally at Lucanus, who was enjoying his meal. The servants who had heard of his generosity served him first with deference, hoping for more largesse. He received the tenderest pieces of the roast goat and the juiciest share of a boiled fowl. The wine was execrable, but his goblet was kept filled. His plate was constantly replenished with the ripest dates and many little salt olives and boiled vegetables. One of the maids with a flourish could open a cactus fruit and elaborately spooned out the soft interior for him so that he wouldn't be wounded on the thorns of the skin. All this the travelers noted with mingled resentment and heightened hostility and suspicion. Lucanus ate hungrily. At the conclusion of the meal, he opened his purse and deposited what was considered an enormous gratuity on the table beside his plate. The travelers stirred and looked at each other. One of them, an arrogant bearded man with angry eyes, spoke bluntly. Who are you, master? I? I'm a physician, Lucanus by name. A Roman? The query was full of contempt. No, a Greek. You speak Aramaic well, master. I speak many languages. For the first time, Lucanus was aware of the hostility. You wear a sword. Is it customary for physicians to wear swords? In a peaceful country, added another. Lucanus looked at his sword and then at the threatening faces. I am an excellent swordsman. I was the best athlete in Alexandria. No one answered him, but all of them glowered. Then one finally spoke uneasy at the cold blue steadiness of Lucanus' eyes. We are peaceable people. We like, dislike weapons. Lucanus shrugged. I sleep with my sword in my hand, he said and rose. He had the thought of wandering about on foot after dining. He abandoned the idea. He went to his room and carefully locked his door and the, lat and the lattices. He took his sword from its sheath and laid it on the bed. He was suddenly exhausted. He lay down and was instantly asleep. He kept his lamp burning. He rose just after dawn and endeared himself to the landlord by not protesting the outrageous bill. The man sent him on his way with loud blessings, and the girls gathered in the courtyard to shrill farewell to him. He followed the river as well as he could, but sometimes the road wound away from it. He was in the wilderness again for a short time. Now many the high hills were broken and bronzed, the color of the earth against a whitely flaming sky. They echoed back the sound of the trotting horse. Lucanus felt alone in the world of vast desolation. Sometimes he saw bleached houses on the hills with a dusty cypress or two, and he wondered how is it possible for any human being to live in this frightful place? When the road turned back to the brilliantly green river again, he rejoiced. 
and he climbed down its banks to bathe his hot arms and legs. At noon, he ate of napkin-wrapped contents of his basket and drank some wine and panted in the unbearable sun. Patches of the river blazed emerald in partings between trees. But in his hands it was cool and clear and fresh. He rode through tiny villages and dogs followed him, barking and snapping at the heels of his horse. He was now in the province of Decapolis and he noted that the people were becoming fairer and taller, blue or gray of eye and light brown of hair or beard. When he passed a herd of goats on the road, the peasant glanced up at him, smiled pleasantly and saluted with his whip. Riding through a village, he passed the little house of a carpenter. The man was surrounded by his four sons and they chattered as they worked on the raw yellow wood, which had a rosinous odor. Lucanus thought of Jesus and his foster father. So he had worked with hammer and chisel and saw, fashioning the plain furniture of the countryside. So Joseph had admonished him for striking a nail crookedly. Lucanus felt closer to Christ near the carpenters than he had felt in Jerusalem or with John and James. A woman came out of the house with a pail of milk and some cups and father and sons stopped to drink deeply. The woman held a distaff in her hands and smiled at Lucanus. Had Christ's mother appeared so to refresh her son and her husband? That twilight, he passed over into the province of Galilee and would have continued to the Sea of Galilee itself, but he found a little inn just as night fell. He was in the country of Jesus when he wrapped his blanket about him, that poor place, he felt that he had come home. Chapter 51 On proceeding the next morning, Lucanus was impressed by the great change in the landscape in the people of Galilee. He passed through a hamlet of little white houses, staring with blinding light under the early sun, surrounded by little fertile gardens and farms, and then beyond mountains of a peculiar and gleaming blackness, broken and rough all against the colorless sky of hot radiance. The clothing of both men and women whom he passed on the road were saw tending kine and black-faced sheep was happier here. And among the dark purple and black robes, he saw yellow and red and blue. They were taller than those in Decapolis or Judea and exceedingly fair with golden or red hair and bright blue or light gray eyes and pale or rosy skins. Men were using scythes on the thistles and cacti, preparing the recovered land for wheat and trees. And there was a cheerful air about them, simple and kind and rustic. Children tended small lambs and fowl. About rippling little streams that crept from the Jade Jordan and laughing as they splashed in the water or threw stones in it. Women sat on doorsteps nursing babies or spinning or scolding toddling infants. A deep and quiet peace stood over the countryside, unmarred 
by the basalt mountains and the heat. Lucanus left the river to follow the road, which climbed a black and jagged mount covered with boulders, the same color. He reached the top to give his horse a breathing space, and he looked about him at what lay below. He was instantly stunned and awed by the scene. He was like one who had laboriously struggled over a dark and barren mountain from hell and then suddenly was confronted by paradise, suffused with ineffable radiance, for in a cup of folding mountains, pale yellowish heliotrope lay the Sea of Galilee, shining and absolutely still, celestially blue and brilliant, with darker blue shadows streaking its flat and incandescent plain. Here was not only calm, but an unearthly peace, more than a complete silence. Even as he watched, the cup of mountains brightened and appeared to coil about the sea like a protecting python. Their hollows filled with gilded dimpled lights. The silent purplish shadows on the sea deepened over the blue expanse. The river Jordan wound away from the sea, emerald green and surrounded by rich fertility of willows and trees and shade and warm thickened earth. No voice or movement broke the hushed quiet, though on the blackish slope below, Lucanus olive and palm groves had been planted and vineyards and fruit trees. The foliage of the olives had the aspect of fretted silver. The green palms didn't stay sway in the pure and windless air. The pomegranates bore their red fruit on their branches like jewels. Sheep slipped about the olive trees, their wool pale gold. There was no cry of a bird here in the aureate effulgence. The peace beyond understanding the light that never lay on land or sea was here caught as in glowing crystal, eternal and unchanging. Lucanus sat on his horse like a statue for a long time, breathing the bright air and basking in the awesome peace. Then he saw Tiberius on the edge of the water the little city built by Herod Antipas in honor of Tiberius, and accursed and avoided by the Jews, for the city had been raised on the site of an old cemetery, which had been called Reketh. The black basalt of the mountain had been used to build the Roman fortress, which guarded the town, and many of the houses though those in the very center were white and saffron with gleaming flat roofs. Lucanus thought here was what he had known and here is where he walked and taught and brought men to him without question. He knew the turquoise sea and these amber mountains shadowed with violet. He began the slow descent to the valley and the sea over the little rough road. He just reached the bottom when he heard the sound of hooves and six soldiers and a centurion cantered from the fortress towards him, armored and helmeted, with spears in their hands which caught the light like flame. The centurion rode ahead and saluted him and grimly smiled. 
Greetings to the noble Lucanus, son of Diodorus Serenus, he said in Latin, enjoying Lucanus' surprise. He was a squat, middle-aged man with a Roman's eagle face and a harsh eyes and sun-brown skin. I'm Alice, the commander of the fortress. Greetings, Alice. But how did you know I was coming? Your friend, Hillel Ben Hamron, wrote me and requested you be given all honor and comfort. Lucanus, though reminding himself of Hillel's solicitude, was somewhat chagrined. He'd hoped to find a small inn where he could remain for some days, meditating in this holy place and wandering where he would and exploring the territory. But he had no choice except to smile in gratitude at Alice, who was watching him. Alice said, and his hard face softened. I was a young subaltern under the heroic Diodorus. I loved him as a father, for he was a great man full of virtue. It delights me that now I look upon his adopted son. The soldiers surrounded Lucanus and the centurion, and they trotted towards the little town and through the gates of the fortress. They led him into the fortress and into a small dining room where refreshments were waiting. Alice ceremoniously drew out a chair for his guest. Here was a blue shade and coolness within the black stony walls. I cannot offer you ostrich wings or the pointed tongues of flamingos, such as they eat in Rome. But we have good fish from the sea, moist dark bread, a goose fruit, and wine of the country. He paused and winked. Shall we first have a goblet of excellent Syrian whiskey? It is potent and makes a man forget his burdens. Lucanus thought the day early for whiskey, but he accepted politely. The liquor was amber in the goblet, but acrid and burning on the tongue and in the throat. Nevertheless, after a few sips, he felt himself exhilarated and laughed and jested with the centurion. His sun flushed face reddened. His blue eyes sparkled. He appeared a youth again. Alice told him that he had engaged apartments for him in the best inn in Tiberias, on the basalt strewn shore of the sea, where he would be comfortable. You are the guest of Rome, said the centurion. It's well known that you're under the protection of Caesar. Alice paused. In his letter, Hillel had merely mentioned that Lucanus wished to tour the country, which intrigued him as a traveler and as a physician. He was also interested in Jewish medicine, and after his signature, Hillel had drawn the minute picture of a fish. The sun wrinkles about the centurion's strenuous eyes deepened. He refilled Lucanus' goblet with more whiskey and pretended to do the same with his. He'd observed Lucanus' original reserve. There was nothing like good whiskey to loosen a man's tongue. Lucanus exclaimed over the small fresh fish, which had been broiled over coals of wood. He delighted in the well-cooked goose, which had been stuffed with breaded herbs and onions. The salad, fruit and cheese, were simple but fresh and excellent in flavor. 
The deep blue silence which surrounded them, the whiskey and the food, diminished some of Lucena's normal taciturnity. He looked at Alice with affection. Never have I eaten so splendid a meal, he said, leaning back on the bench to sip his wine and enjoy his sense of well-being. Alice smiled. He wondered what the real reason for Lucanus' visit to this quiet place was. Lucanus had been the guest of Pontius Pilate, that ruthless and haughty patrician. He dined with Herod Antipas. He'd been a protege of Tiberius. He was wealthy, the adopted son of a noble house. Alice didn't believe he was merely touring, and he would find anything of interest here in medicine. It could be that he was very dangerous, a handsome spy. Alice scratched his chin and reflected. He had not only himself to protect, but several of his soldiers who loved him. Idly, Alice dipped his finger in his goblet, and as, as if thinking of something else, he slowly moved his wet finger over the table and drew a crude fish. Then he looked up quickly at Lucanus with his sharp and piercing black eyes. Lucanus saw the wet image drawn in wine. His face changed, became gentle, yet amazed. He returned Alice's regard, then deliberately wet his own finger and drew the same image. Alice frowned, still suspicious and very surprised. He said, have things become more orderly in Jerusalem since the crucifixion of the that Galilean Jew Jesus, I've heard they were very bad for a time. Lucanus looked at the wall thoughtfully. He too was suspicious. Then he opened his pouch and drew out his rings and put them on his fingers. They scintillated in the cool dusk of the small dining room. And Alice looked at them with admiration. This ring was given to me by a Caesar when I was young. I never used it until three months ago when I gave it to Pontius Pilate and he sent it to Caesar. Pilate had prescribed the Christians who were innocent men. I asked that the prescription be lifted and so it was. You've heard of the lifting of that prescription? Yes, Alice said. He folded his muscular arms on the table, and his eyes met those of Lucanus directly. I didn't know that you were the cause of it, Lucanus. He looked down at the two drawings of the fish, which had dried red on the white wood. May I ask why? But Lucanus said, when Jesus was here in Galilee, did you hear him yourself? I did. The centurion's face was inscrutable. Well, I heard of him when I was a child on the day he was born. Lucanus then briefly told Alice of what he had known and he watched him closely as he spoke. Alice's face slowly became illuminated and softened. A slow look of exultation dawned in his eyes. When he had finished, Lucanus showed him the cross on the gold chain about his neck. Alice was silent for a long time. Then he whispered, Peace be unto you, Lucanus. And to you, Alice. Seeing Lucanus' expression, he knew 
he need no longer fear. He rose and beckoned to Lucanus, who followed him outside in the dazzling light. Alice pointed to a mount not far away on which was a poor synagogue made of basalt with white painted doors and a flat tiled roof. There he spoke often. I could not enter, of course, but I listened at the door. Followed by his disciples, he'd stand on the shore and speak to the people. And on a certain day, I heard him preach on the open mount. And I stood among the people, the poor men and women of the region, and listened. Alice paused. The sun lay vividly on his changed face. I tell you, Lucanus, it was impossible to hear him and not feel your heart move in you. Who is he? I asked myself, what gods ever spoke like this? Our venal, capricious, and cruel gods. What hope or peace or joy or promise did they ever bring to men in their corruption and engrossment with their own godly pleasures? But this man spoke of God's mercy and love for his children, of his everlasting watchfulness, of eternal life and bliss, of God's pity and desire that men come to him not merely to praise him and prostrate themselves before him in fear, but to rejoice with him through eternity, partaking of his own happiness. What manner of man is this? I ask myself amazed. Why does he speak with such authority, like one who brings a message from a great king? Why did the people regard him with such joy and love and silence fill them so that they would not miss a word? Why did they follow him like a retinue and crowd about him to look upon his face and touch his garments? The children in their mother's arms laughed with pleasure and they smiled upon them and his face was like the sun itself. And yet, what in his appearance could stir one? He wore the garments of a Galilean peasant with poor sandals of rope. He had no money, no servants, and he walked on foot. This is a quiet place, Lucanus. But from the hour when he appeared here, it took on the peace you observe this deep and holy peace, and has never departed. One day, my friend, I stood at the edge of the crowd, listening, and he told the people of a prayer they must say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. His voice rang over the mountains like summer thunder, and the people prayed with him. And when they'd completed their prayer, his eyes suddenly found me, wondering and confused. And he smiled upon me over the people's heads. And from that moment, I was his. I would have died for him with joy. But I can't explain why, for I'm a Roman. He was only a Galilean Jew and a carpenter. Nor did this miracle come to me alone. Several of my men listened to him also, and he took their hearts in his hand. Alice sighed. I was transformed. The world of Rome wasn't important to me. 
my anxieties and troubles vanished. I was at peace. I was filled with exultation. The earth was no longer populated with enemies, but with friends. I had only one desire to perfect myself so that I would be worthy to lie at his feet and look upon him forever. How can one explain this? One has to experience it for himself. But I can say this. I now see all things shedding a light of their own. The moon never beamed so silvery a light before. Nor was ever the sun so radiant to my eyes. Men to me no longer have a station. One shouldn't be honored for mere position or wealth, but only for virtue. Moreover, all men to me now are my brothers, even the lowliest. Sometimes I say to myself, but you are a Roman, the master of the world. And it doesn't mean anything to me. Again, I remind myself, we have the leadership of all the earth and a voice in my spirit answers. That nation which seeks leadership of the earth is doomed to death, for it is an evil nation. No matter its lofty pretensions, men seek leadership only to dominate and enslave all others. They looked upon the scene about them. The light had changed. The coiling mountains were washed with deep purple of various hues. The sea had taken upon itself the color of an aquamarine streaked with cobalt, and the sky was like blue enamel. Lucanus felt from it all a spiritual emanation, profound and vast and unchanging, as if unseen celestial beings hovered over all things winged with the sun. One day, sorry, says low voice, one day they brought ten lepers to him, weeping women and men and children. They cried to him for mercy and the people moved away from them in fear. But he touched them, lifted his hands over them and they were cured instantly. And the great crowd rejoiced and the former afflicted fell at his feet and kissed them. I saw this with my own eyes. You must believe me. Oh, I believe you, said Lucanus gently. That evening, Lucanus wrote down all which the centurion had told him over a period of long hours. All the parables which Christ had uttered in Galilee, all the glorious things which he had said. Lucanus remembered the stone which had been mysteriously removed from the sepulcher where they had laid him after his crucifixion. As that stone had been removed, not by human hands, so the stone which had closed upon a dead heart can be moved aside only by the love of God and the heart made alive again. Make me worthy to write of you and to follow you and bestow your grace upon me, O oh Father. He prayed humbly. When Herod had built Tiberias in honor of Tiberias, the Jews would not enter the desecrated place. But Herod had many Galileans seized and impressed into service and houses in the town. They were the wretched ones who had seen and known and loved Jesus, as well as those from Cana and Magdala 
and Capernaum, towns near the sea. He'd made their lot endurable, those who battled with the black and rusty soil and moved the somber stones of the region and who were oppressed by the Romans and their own masters. The inn to which Aulus had taken Lucanus was very large and pleasant, and the innkeeper was a kindly man who was proud of his simple but lavish table and the clean cleanliness of his chambers. The building stood on the shore of the sea which was strewn with heavy black basalt stones, tumbling down the slight incline to the azure water. Before it was a flagged terrace, and great willows with whitish trunks spotted with brown leaned over the small and faintly rippling waves. Lucanus sat on the terrace in a comfortable chair, alone, though all about him travelers drank a little at tables and ate sweetmeats and conversed with gestures and an eager. Many of them were merchants. The Kenneth was glad when they rose to enter the inn for the evening meal. Now he could watch the mountains deepen to a deeper purple, and the sea take on their motionless reflections. Moment by moment, the scene became even more silent, vaster, more imminent. The sky darkened to an intense violet, and the water changed with it. The sun left the earth, the crescent moon, fiery white, rose above a mount and looked at her image in the water and stars danced not only in the sky but on the sea from the small synagogue on the mount to look in his left came the chanting of prayers intensifying the quiet god has seen and heard all of this God had prayed in that little synagogue. He had gazed at this very moon, this hyacinth water shivering with stars, these willows, these black cypresses, these bushes with their yellow lily-like flowers, those pomegranates near the Jade River, these palm and olive trees, surrounding Tiberias, this green valley. Blessed am I that you have given me life to know you, said Lucanus in his heart. I'm undeserving. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. And that's it. Chapter 52 is next. You know, this is interesting because we're in the 94% of this book having been read. And he, Luke has never met Paul. What do you think's coming? Got a hunch. See you next time.